Hey guys, it's Amber from Notable Ink. Welcome back. Today I'm sharing techniques that you can use to immediately improve your watercolor projects. If you've been scared to mix your own colors thus far, then this is a great video for you. Let's get started. Simon Says Stamp just dropped their Make Merry release, so I'll have a link to that release down below if you want to check it out. This is the Center Cut Holiday Floral Stamp Set. It's a huge floral stamp set. It's a red rubber cling stamp, which I love for background stamps. It's my favorite type of stamp for that. And you can see that the sentiment in the middle pops right out. So it's connected just a little bit and you just need to pop it out. What's nice about that is you know exactly where to put it back into place because those little notches match up when you go to set the sentiment back in. I'll set the sentiment aside for now and I'll ink up the stamp with the Wow Embossing Pad. This is a clear sticky ink that's slow drying and allows you to heat emboss. Heat embossing can eliminate some of the stress of watercolor for beginners. What it does is that it creates these small borders and wells that will contain the pigment in each individual petal and leaf that you're coloring. Whereas if you didn't have the raised edge of the heat embossing and you tried to paint two petals that were next to each other, the colors would bleed into each other. So it just eliminates a little bit of the stress if you're brand new to watercolor. Here I have the Wow Gilded Embossing Powder, and this is part of a trio that you can see in the upper left corner there. It's called Totally Amazing. There's two teal colors, a blue teal and a green teal, and this gorgeous gilded color. Now I chose gilded because it's a really soft neutral, almost like a cream and a platinum embossing powder mix. It's got a touch of glitter in it, but because it's so neutral and so light, it's going to create somewhere between a no line watercolor effect and also but still have a visible outline um, and I thought that would be a really pretty look whenever I heat an embossing powder with that has glitter or texture I start heating from behind first start to melt your powder and then once your embossing powder starts to melt you can finish off the embossing from the front that allows the glitter to be embedded in that melting embossing powder without being blown away if you get a little bit of warping, just bend your paper back. And then I felt a little bit of grit on the surface, so I'm just using the Nouveau Surface Sweep to knock off any excess powder. Here I have my pocket palette of Daniel Smith watercolor. There's 28 colors in here. And I'm gonna spend a lot of time in this video showing the mixing of the colors. Basically, when I started this project, what I really wanted to do was get to know my Daniel Smith watercolors better because they're new to me. And to do that, I need to play around with color mixing. Well, I don't enjoy making swatches, so I thought I would experiment with color mixing and create a project at the same time. So here I have quinacridone pink. I will have all of the color mixtures listed in my blog post, but I'll pop them up on the screen as I go along as well. And I also have Viridian. So Viridian and the color swatches that you see on the top right above the card match the palettes here. So you can see that that's a blue green mixed with the quinacridone pink, which is a cool red. It creates this dusky purple. I'll go through and I'll use those two colors in different amounts and you'll see completely different colors are made. So I also wanted to test quinacridone pink with sap green because typically red and green make brown. That wasn't the case as we saw with the Verdian and the quinacridone pink. It created a purple because it was a green that leaned more towards blue. Sap green is a yellow green and you can see when you mix that with the quinacridone pink, it creates a terracotta color, which is really pretty, but I have some, some, some poinsettias here. So I wanted to create more of a deep rich red that kind of leaned towards the pink. So I've added a little more quinacridone pink and I have a really nice deep red there. So with my little bit of experimenting here, I decided I wanted to go for more of a dusky colored um, painting. So more neutralized colors. Normally I go for super vibrant colors, but again, I wanted to experiment with my paints and see what other colors I could come up with. Here I decided to add um, buff titanium to quinacridone pink. Now buff titanium, is a cream color, it's like ecru, you can see there, but it's very opaque. 
Um, it has a lot of white in it. And so you should definitely know that going in, it's going to take any of your transparent paints and turn them opaque. So you can see that I have a really milky rose color here. Um, so if you're wanting to keep your paints translucent, then don't add buff titanium or white to them. Just water them down with water instead. So I'm using a wet on wet technique and I'm just dropping in some water into a couple of the petals and then I'll add this dusky rose color. It's the buff titanium and quinacridone pink. And I'll cover all of the poinsettias, both of the poinsettias, all of the petals in the same way. I'll let that dry just a little bit and then I'll come back in with my second coat. So here's what you can see it looks like. So now we need to start adding some shadow. So again, this is the quinacridone pink and sap green mixture. So I'm dropping this in at the base and the petals are still a little bit damp. So you can see that the color is starting to spread out. Some of the petals were more dry than others. So I'm coming in with a clean brush. So this is just a damp brush and I'm just softening the edges so that I don't have sharp edges. That's going to help the darker color run a little bit. This is, I have mixed feelings about this. So it's going to take a lot of my light areas and remove them because you can see that the darker color is spreading completely over the petals. So I've lost a little bit of my shadow and just created darker petals in some of the instances, but I like how this looks. So now I'll add a little bit of this dusky purple to the base of some of those petals. I won't add it to all of them. I'll add it to a few of them to add greater depth of shadow there. It's not a very saturated color, so you can see that it doesn't add a huge amount of shadow to the base of these petals. It's just pretty subtle. So now I want to mix a dusky teal. So that purple mixture was carnacridone pink with viridian added to it. This time I'm going to use more viridian and add quinacridone pink to it just a little bit. It's going to create a dusky teal. I have three different types of, uh, of leaves, so I want to use three different types of greens in this um, painting, but still keep things connected. And I'll talk more about that as we mix the other colors. So I'm adding just a little bit of quinacridone pink and here I added a bunch more and look at this beautiful soft navy that it creates. It's like a, almost like a Payne's blue gray. It's so pretty how these two colors neutralize each other. And so I'm going to add back more of the Viridian and this is going to give me that dusky teal that I was after. So I'm going to paint the, I would consider these pine bows in this color. I'll also create another mixture of this and do that circle in the middle to bring more teal into the overall project. And I'm just using a wet on dry technique for this. It's, they're such small leaves that if you used a wet on wet technique, you'd be at more risk of it just bleeding outside the lines. Here I'm going to use, put a little bit of perylene green on my palette and I can't decide if I want to take that straight to the leaf or not. I decided not and I'm going to add a coat of water to the leaves. So these leaves are a little bit larger. So instead of doing wet on dry, I'll do a wet on wet technique. I decided to put down serpentine green first. Now this is a yellow green. You can see it on the swatch card above. This is a little bit more of a yellow green and I'll drop the pyrrolein into this. Now pyrrolein is one of my favorite colors. It's that deep dark green in the center of the bottom row on the swatch card. It's more of a cool green, I would say, but it's super dark. It is a little bit similar to the dusky teal that we made, but it's not quite as blue. So I'm just gonna drop that into the serpentine leaves and just allow it to mix on its own. For the berries, I'm mixing quinacridone coral with quinacridone pink. These are going to stick out a little bit like a sore thumb because they don't go with the rest of the color scheme. These are going to be a warm red where everything else on this painting is a cool color. I think it helped a little bit that I added the quinacridone pink to the mixture, otherwise they would have looked really out of place. So for my next green, I'm going to mix a vibrant green. So I have that Viridian mixture that I already had there. I'm going to add a Hansa yellow to it, Viridian, 
I'll add a little bit of the, mi the red mix that we made and pyrrolene green. For my holly leaves, I wanted to have more of a vibrant, true green. And that's why I'm adding this yellow to it. Hansa yellow is a cool yellow though. So it's different than the sap green. The sap green is more of a warm yellow base, which is why it turned that red to a brown. Whereas you can see this is a super vibrant green. Now, at this point, I'm still experimenting with my color mixing. Like what kind of combinations can I get? What happens if I add this color to the mix or that color? You can see I added a little bit of the red mixture there to tone it down because it was looking almost neon green. That's like not a normal in nature kind of color. Here I added a little bit of the pyrrolene green, remembering that holly leaves are pretty dark and I added too much. So I really like super saturated paints. So your quinacridones, your pyrrolines, um, your thalos, those are all in incredibly saturated paints. What that means is a little bit goes a long way. So you can just barely touch it with your brush and pick up a large amount of paint. That's kind of how I prefer to do things. Whereas your Prima Tech line or your genuine paints from Daniel Smith, those I find are not as saturated. So you need a lot more paint to get the saturation that you're looking for on your page, at least for my style of painting. Um, so that's something to think about in terms of the cost of your supplies. The quinacridones, the thalos, and the pyrroles, they're going to go a long way, which means your tubes are going to last longer. It's a little more cost effective. So I've dropped in the lighter green first, and then I dropped in a little bit of the darker green into one side of the leaf or at the base of the leaf to get a variance in color. I really prefer it when the leaves aren't just flat when they have a multitude of colors in them. Okay, so now that we have all this color variation in our leaves, our poinsettias are looking very, very flat. The color has dried back, they're not nearly as saturated, so I'm covering the entire poinsettia with clean, clear water, and then I'm gonna drop in some darker pigment again. So we have our mix up there, but I decided to now switch over to pyrrole crimson. This is a cool red, so it's very similar to quinacridone pink, except for it leans a little more red rather than pink, So, but it's, it's also super saturated. You can see I went ahead and did the larger poinsettia as well, and that one ended up being darker than the one at the bottom, so I'm having to retouch the poinsettia at the bottom so that the shadows look similar. If you find that the paint isn't moving, it could be that the under layer of paint dried already. So just clean your brush and come in from the tip of the petal and bring the water towards the shadow and you'll see it start to spread out. Now here it looks beautiful and I should have stopped here, but I can't stop myself and I keep adding more red. Look at the top poinsettia. There are hard edges everywhere because the petals were already dry. So I've had to clean my brush wet it and I'm going to come in with the clean brush from the top of the petal, bring that water down to those hard edges and get it to blend out. Now a note about this, you need to clean your brush often because you'll start to pick up that red pigment and you'll spread it all over the place. So wipe off your brush, clean your brush, keep bringing in clean clear water to get that to spread. So that looks a little bit better. We'll talk more about that later in the video. I decided it would be fun to paint the center and I'm using Viridian with a bit of that coral mix that's above it to create a dusky teal. So one of the things that you're noticing as I go through this painting is in almost all of my mixtures, I have Viridian. So that Viridian and Quinacridone Pink are the colors that are tying this whole project together. Because I continually add the same colors to these mixtures, it makes the painting more cohesive. And that is a way that you can immediately improve your watercolor projects. So for this light teal, I used Viridian with a little bit of the coral. Now I'm using Viridian and a lot more of the coral mix to get a darker color. I'll add more Viridian to that. That gives me a darker teal so that I can start to shade this circle. 
So to me, where the center of that poinsettia on the top is, this almost looks like a Christmas ornament. It looks like a Christmas bobble to me, which is how I started to paint it. I'm shading it like it's a Christmas ornament. So I'm adding this darker teal at the base, and as I continue to add this, I decide that I need even a darker color. So this is when I realize what the problem is with my poinsettia. You're going to see this in a few minutes. I didn't need to continue to add red to my poinsettias. What I needed was a darker shade. I needed a gray or a purple. So here I'll mix my own gray with the Viridian Coral Mixture, the Pyrrole Crimson, and this is going to create a teal gray. So this gray has the same tonal quality as the teal that I have on the orb that I'm painting right now. So that is going to make your project look more cohesive and improve your watercolor painting as opposed to using a gray straight out of the pan. So you can see on the bottom row on the far right, I have neutral tint there. So I could have just taken a gray straight from the pan, but it wouldn't be as harmonious as making your own gray out of the colors that are already in your painting. You're going to get a gray that's going to match what you have going on already if you mix it yourself with those same colors. We know that the green and the red neutralize each other. You just have to get that mixture to the point where it creates that gray. So I'm using that same gray for the center of the flowers and here's where you're going to see it goes up into the flower petal and I'm like, oh, okay, that's what I needed. That's what the poinsettia is needed. Just making them more red with the pyrrole crimson wasn't really the answer I was going for. I wanted these dusky flowers and what was happening is the poinsettias were getting more and more vibrant with the addition of red and I really needed to deepen it with a gray. So here I wanted to add splatter to the painting because I didn't fancy painting the background, but I also didn't want these flowers just floating off in space. So this whole time I've been painting with a number eight round brush, but you can see it's quite pointy so I can get into those areas. So I'm going to do some small splatter with the round eight brush. And I just put the stamp there because I was too lazy to cut a mask and I didn't want too much of the splatter getting on the circle because that's where I'm going to put my sentiment. So I'm going to splatter green, I'll splatter red. Of course, I'm using the colors that I've already mixed up because that's, you know, I want everything to look cohesive. After I get these small splatters, I decide I want more substantial splatters. So I switch to either a 10 or a 12 round brush to get larger splatters. And I'm really covering it. I'm going to town because I want there to be some substantial splatters to create this background. If you're not getting enough splatter, try wetting your brush more, load up your brush with a lot of water and then pick up your pigment and you'll get more splatter. Then I decided to add some buff titanium because I thought that would coordinate well with the embossed lines. It has a similar creamy quality to it. Um, you could also let the panel dry, splatter it with water, and then throw on some embossing powder and get embossed splatters, which is also a really cool effect. I decided that I wanted to have some of that buff titanium in the center of the orb there, and that paint is still wet, so you're going to see the buff titanium blend into the dusky teal that we have there just a little bit. So I'll let this panel completely dry, and it doesn't take very long, and then I'll come back in and stamp the sentiment. So I'm inking up the sentiment with the same clear embossing ink. I'll go ahead and stamp that. And I must have been a little too aggressive with my stamping because you'll see when I put on the embossing powder, there are these two areas here. They're almost perfect. These two like semicircles that you can see above the piece sentiment to almost so perfect that I almost thought it was part of the stamp. I looked at the stamp again. I'm like, what are those? I think I just pressed so hard that it impressed those as well. So weird. Anyway, I just use a clean dry brush and I keep this reserved for my embossing and um, I'm just going to knock off that extra embossing powder before I go ahead and heat it. When I take the panel off to the side, it's because I'm blowing on it. When I first started doing videos, I blew on it on camera and I blew all of the embossing powder that was in the coffee liner everywhere. It was a hot mess. So anytime you see me take an embossing powder 
project off to the side, it's because I'm blowing on it. So on each of the WOW bottles has a designation. This one said O on it in parentheses, which means opaque. It means that the powder is opaque, which means that you can use it to emboss on colored cardstock. I knew that ahead of time, which is why I knew I would be able to paint this center circle and still be able to read my sentiment, even though it's a pretty light embossing powder. Look how pretty it is. Here's the finished project and I love the blended quality of this embossing powder and just the subtle tones of it. I think it goes so beautifully with the watercolor. You can see that we have different types of greens in our leaves and everything is cohesive because we've mixed all of our greens with that same viridian. Our quinacridone pink was also mixed with viridian. So everything in this piece is cohesive except for those berries. Look at those berries and how they stick out because that was quinacridone coral instead of quinacridone pink. They kind of like stick out like sore thumbs. So to recap, embossing your image can reduce your stress by creating those little wells for you to paint inside and then create our harmonious color scheme by mixing your own colors. Pick one or two colors and then tie those throughout all the mixtures and definitely mix your own grays with the same colors you've used in your project. If you guys enjoyed this video, hit that like button and let me know what you think down below. Please consider subscribing if you haven't already and I'll see you soon with more inspiration. Mm -hmm.